scream. Kevin is dragged out, handcuffed. His car is ransacked, but there's no signs of any bomb. <laughs> You're not gonna find it! He's hauled to the station. The officers don't find a logic bomb, but they know about a crime Kevin committed. A friend told the police everything. He's sentenced to 12 months in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. He sits in the courtroom, betrayed and alone. His attorneys plead with a judge that his hacking is an addiction rather than criminal behavior. They say the young man needs help, not a prison cell. Kevin rises and pleads his case to the judge. By now, he's a veteran in deception. The judge agrees and orders that Kevin serve his sentence in a halfway house for those with compulsive disorders. Kevin laughs as he's listening to the ruling. He was arrested for tricking his way into a computer system, and now he deceives the judge into thinking that he's the victim of his own crimes. It's a few weeks until supervised release ends, and the demon on his shoulder is whispering. He starts learning about Pacific Bell, a telephone company based in California. An idea appears. If he gets caught, he'll be sent to jail, but if he doesn't, then he'd have fooled the authorities right under their noses. No! No! Soon, he has all the passwords and credentials he needs to take control of the company's voicemails. Kevin is on the run for two years. He loses 100 pounds. When he learns that how a criminal walks is the number one way they're recognized, he puts pebbles in his shoes to change his stride. He uses over a dozen different names. His favorite is Eric Wise. He begins a crime spree that infiltrates the world's biggest companies, Nokia. The companies say the damage from the hacks totals. Kevin sips his coffee as he reads the paper, and suddenly, a chill passes down his spine. FBI agents take their positions outside the house in California. They see their target sitting inside. Burst in and draw their weapons, and the man denies that he's Kevin Mitnick. He's a Middle Eastern immigrant, doesn't even own a computer. More than 2,000 kilometers away in Seattle, Kevin throws his paper to the ground, his name emblazoned on the front page of the New York Times. Kevin is adamant the stories in the articles are lies. He never hacked into NORAD or wiretapped the NSA. But if you believe Kevin, then you shouldn't trust anything you've heard so far about Kevin. He takes on mythical status overnight. The little-known prankster is now public enemy number one of cyberspace. Kevin walks the streets of Seattle in a daze. Many of the passing faces on the sidewalk seem to be staring straight back at him. He hears the faint sound of a helicopter in the sky. He feels his heart beginning to thump. No one seems to notice the helicopter, but they do notice Kevin. He hurries into the courtyard of an apartment complex and uses the tall trees as cover peering through the leaves. Kevin tosses a package into the bushes and bursts into a full-on sprint. He gets away. But from what? One of America's top cybersecurity experts is finalizing plans to leave for a ski vacation the next day. And suddenly, his own computer is hacked. His phone rings. Your security technique will be defeated. Your technique is no good. To someone like him, the attack and subsequent taunts are an act of war. He sets up a series of stealth monitoring posts and creates his own software to track the hacker. He waits in silence until the alarm is triggered. He traces the intruder to a computer modem connected to a cellular telephone somewhere on the East Coast. A man steps out onto his balcony in Raleigh, North Carolina, when suddenly a chill passes down his spine. 
the FBI agents take their positions outside the house. They see their target sitting inside. Journalist John Markoff watches from the street. The agents burst in and draw their weapons, but find nothing. The man furiously denies that he's Kevin Mitnick. He's so convincing the FBI agents are about to leave. But then, an agent notices an old ski jacket in the cupboard. He empties the pockets, and out falls a paste-up. Legacy Media pitches up their circus tents outside. The most wanted computer hacker is behind bars. Kevin shares one large holding cell with 60 other inmates. He doesn't eat for two days because the food isn't kosher. Inside, all eyes are fixed on the defendant. Kevin is charged with 14 counts of wire fraud, eight counts of possession of unauthorized access devices, interception of wire or electronic communications, and causing damage to a computer. When Kevin is led away from the court, Tsutomu calls out from the front row. Kevin looks back at his nemesis, the one man who finally saw through the lies and deceptions to find him. He nods, says nothing, and walks away. His appeals for bail are churned down by every single court in the U.S., including the Supreme. Kevin says the beefed-up charges are an injustice and is trying